good evening, and thank you so much. Thanks, Ben, for having me and uh, the Free Market Institute for hosting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I hope that tonight we can spend some time together uh, talking about uh, the ideas of Christianity and what they lead us towards in terms of uh, kind of societal objectives. And I would want, I want to put you at ease, so I, as Ben mentioned, I work for an organization that speaks explicitly to people who call themselves Christians. And so our role and my role as an economist there is to do research. I, I work with theologians, and we try to create a narrative. What does scripture say about how to live life? And what does economics have to do with that? How does it help us make personal contributions to the societal good, if you will? So I want to put you at ease, though, because if you're not a Christian, I'm not here to convert you. Uh, but I am here, perhaps, to give you assumptions that you can adopt, even if you don't adopt Christianity, that I think are important that lead us to kind of flourishing, which is an idea that I'm going to talk about. So I have kind of four things that I want to address uh, tonight, I want to make the case that if you are a Christian, um, your job is to go to Scripture to inform you of how um, to live your life and in terms of what your responsibilities are. So you have a job to do, is my first assertion. And your job, whatever that is, you must do well and with integrity. And you need a certain institutional setting for that to be able to happen, not just for you, but for everybody else. And when that institutional setting or environment is present, you are not the only person that benefits. You actually are incentivized to serve strangers. And so this is the kind of the moral outcomes of living a life that I'm going to make the claim scripture encourages you to lead. So kind of finding your purpose, how it relates to you, and then how does that percolate up to kind of society and uh, the common good. So I'm making the claim that we must, as Christians, support economic freedom. We do not have a choice. It is a non-negotiable. So what I want to do, kind of these four parts, I'm going to start to uh, build the house that we're going to live in, if you will, from a theological perspective. And then I'm going to bring in the economic way of thinking. And the goal is to combine those two in a way that helps us understand how to live. So um, this is not showing up that well, but this is a picture of a jigsaw puzzle. Anybody ever done a jigsaw puzzle when you were a kid or now? Um, what are one of the first things that you do when you do a jigsaw puzzle? Somebody just shout it out. Yeah, you turn the pieces over, right? What do you do even before you turn the pieces over? You find the edges. What do you do before you find the edges? You look at the picture, right? And so the picture is on the top of the box, right? And so we take all the pieces, we dump them out on a table, and if you're a puzzle cheater like me, you actually put the box on the windowsill or prop it up on a vase so that you know what the end is supposed to be. You actually have a picture of what you're working towards. Puzzles are easy that way. And there's an answer that's right, and there's a lot of answers that are wrong and they're obvious. Um, economies don't work that way. There's not a puzzle. Uh, we don't exactly know when we get up in the morning even what the puzzle is supposed to look like for us at the end of our day. And so change is inherent to everything we do, and there's a lot of uncertainty. So I want to make that case is that we're starting from a, a system or a, a, a set of conditions in which we don't exactly know what we're working toward. So the ideas that I'm going to talk about are how do, you can make your contributions to something that's good versus something that's bad, knowing that we don't have the specifics. So I'm going to talk about three things here. From a Christian perspective, what are God's design and desires? Because a Christian would say, I want to do what God tells me to do, because I believe that's right. And that's what theology is. It's the guide to faith and practice. So what are God's design? Who are we? How do we operate? And what are his desires? And if you're a Christian, then I'm making the assumption that you want to live into those desires. And then what principles in creation inform how we should live today? So I also think that scripture is helpful for not only thinking about the past, but also for life in 2016. What are we supposed to do and how do we do it? And then how does the call to work, which is I'm going to make the claim is the fundamental call of scripture, how does that call to work require good economic thinking and uh, require economic freedom? So that's what I want to try to weave together. So I'm going to start here with God's purposes in creation. And we start right 
um, in Genesis, because that's where we get a lot of information about what we're supposed to do and how we do it. So this is Genesis 1, 26, 28. I'm not going to read all of this, but I want you to get the highlights in the event that you haven't seen this in a long time, or maybe you haven't seen it at all. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So that's verse 26. So God created mankind in his own image. That's a very important phrase. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, fruitful, and increase in number. So there's two commands there. Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. So what do all those things? That's a lot of marching orders right there. And we need to unpack what does that mean for us? How does it inform, again, life in the 21st century? I highlight the word earth here because I think it's really important. Because if you look at the full narrative of Genesis, which we don't have time to you know, uh, fully go through right now, you see that God put man and woman in the Garden of Eden. Okay, so it was a place of abundance, it was a place of prosperity, it was a place of thriving, of having everything that you needed. But we weren't supposed to stay in the garden. We were supposed to fill the earth. So there's this idea that even from our creation, God's design and desires for us were for us to use our creativity to fill the earth and to be fruitful. What does it mean in your own life to be fruitful? Well, I'm going to talk about that, and the economic way of thinking is very helpful for us as we understand the mechanisms by which that takes place. So, kind of moving on here with God's design and desire, his design is his own glory. So you can think of something that's infinitely good, that wants to be glorified in what it has created. I think if you're a Christian, what's really profound, if you think about it, is that God didn't need us. He's perfect. He is the master creator, the master architect, the master artist. He didn't need us, but he wanted us. So his desire is for us to do good things. Being made in his image is key to this idea, which I'm going to pull out in a second. So his desire is for his glory. What glorifies him when his creation operates the way it should? And that leads us to this bigger idea that I'm going to talk about called flourishing. When everything operates the way it is supposed to, the way it was intended to. And how is that manifested in our own lives? Well, there's a couple of things that we think about when we think about human nature. I'm going to go over these ideas in a minute. But we are always advancing towards the future. We are not in a state, in some ways, of equilibrium mathematically, right? We're not at rest. We're always moving. There's a desire to create, desire to do, a desire to be happy. And so that's part of who we are. How does that happen? Well, I'm going to make the case that it's when we unleash our creativity on the planet and we come together in community, because that's actually the only way that this can happen. We need each other. So we have to find a way to come together in community. So we're created to work. Genesis 2.15, so I, I showed you a verse from the first chapter of Genesis where we get our marching orders, and the marching orders continue. Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. So there's two separate ideas there, to work it and to take care of it. To work it, if you look at the original Hebrew translation, it's the word abad, and that is literally translated to serve. So we're to serve the creation and to take care of it. So I want you to think about if you've ever been asked to be a house sitter. Okay, and you know, you're a college student, so we have college students in the room. I remember those days where I do a lot of odd jobs to make extra money. If you are a house sitter and you go to someone's house, you're taking care of it, right? You're bringing in the newspaper, you're checking on the mail, you're watering the plants, you're feeding the cat. You're not putting an addition on the backyard, right? That might be more than what you would be required to do. So there's a distinction between taking care of the creation and working it. So we're not supposed to leave it untouched in its original state. We are actually supposed to work it. How do we do that? We do it by applying our human creativity to what's there. And so this is where we're going to start to build this case of what, you know, again, this is my claim, is that our job is to bring about greater levels of human flourishing. And that there's unique ways that each one of us are called to do that. 
but there's, a, there's systems under which that works well, and there's systems under which that does not work at all. And so Jonathan Pennington, who's a PhD in theology, writes this. He says, what we're after is shalom, and you hear the word shalom used in the scripture many, many, many times. We often translate shalom as peace. And when we think about peace, we think about the absence of conflict. That is a very shallow, I would say, interpretation of the word shalom. Shalom is a much richer concept than just the absence of conflict. And he says it means human health, wholeness, resulting in strength, fertility, and longevity. The vision of shalom is at the core of God's redeeming work. That's also important. It means it's not a subsidiary idea. It is the core of God's redeeming work in the world is flourishing. And flourishing has all of these things as a part of it. Now, how do we get human health? How do we get longevity? These things increase our autonomy over our own lives. We need to incorporate, we must incorporate the economic way of thinking into how we live this out in our own unique ways. And so even before the fall, which is something that Christians talk about a lot, so you have this original state, this original condition, where God creates us, he creates everything on the planet, and then we're there to, to do something. And I've made the claim that we're there to work it and take care of it. And we do that by being creative and using our gifts. But what I would say is that even before the fall, where sin mars all this stuff and makes it a lot more complicated, we have knowledge problems, information problems, greed, all sorts of bad things enter into this system, we were limited, finite, and purposeful. This is part of who we are. So you think of, just go back to the very first chapter of Genesis, Adam and Eve in the garden. Adam and Eve had everything they needed to make tables. But we can presume, because we don't know, that they didn't actually have tables. So they had to tinker and innovate and think and be entrepreneurial and engage in ideas so that they could say, hey, there's a tree here and I could potentially make it into a table. There was learning built into who we were. So that is what separates us from a Christian theological perspective from God. Okay, we are kind of sub-creators is the word that I like to use. We're not creating something out of nothing, but we are creating something out of something and we have to learn because we're still finite and limited in our own rights. Now, scripture goes on, and we leave the Old Testament, I'm doing a lot in a little amount of time here, but we see that this idea is reinforced through scripture, and that's really important, by the way. I mean, we're in a presidential elate, a debate, a presidential election, which is highly volatile, where people are vying for, you know, Christians in terms of how they should vote. And I think to get clarity on what we should do and how we should live and what are the right ways to get to that, we need to understand that scripture does not contradict itself. So the marching orders that are given to us in Genesis are reaffirmed through both the Old and the New Testament. And so here we see Jeremiah. This is a letter written by the prophet Jeremiah to the exiles in Babylon. And this verse says, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you. For if it prospers, you prosper. If it prospers, you prosper. So you see again the idea and the metaphor of leaving the garden and going in to build a city. This is not for us like driving to New York City, right? A city that's already built. That actually our marching orders in Genesis are to leave the garden and build cities. And build communities. And that there are kind of this idea here of profit seeking. And prophets, I like to translate as leftovers. Having enough so that you have time and energy and finances left over to do other things with. When we seek the prosperity of the city, we prosper. We prosper, it prospers. So there's this idea here of some mutual gains from trade. So we need to kind of seek that out through the rest of Scripture and understand what it means. And so there's one other reference here. This is the parable of the talents. You may have heard of it before. Uh, this appears in Matthew and Luke. Luke, I'm using the Matthew version here. The, the story here is that the master entrusts different amounts of bags of gold. A talent is a bag of gold. And he entrusts 
his caretakers with different amounts. And the scripture says he gives them different amounts according to their abilities, which means that the person who owns the talents has the property rights in them and is giving somebody else temporary stewardship or ownership of those talents. One gets five, one gets two, one gets one. You may remember this story. And what happens? The person who has five talents goes and makes five more. The person who has two talents goes and makes two more. The person who has one talent goes out back, digs a hole in the yard, buries the talent. The master comes back, and to the five-talent servant, he says, well done. You will enter into the joy. I will put you in charge of many things. You will enter the joy of the master, and I will put you in charge of many things. You did what I asked. To the two-talent servant, he says the same thing. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the master. I have put you in charge of a few things. Now I will put you in charge of many things. To the one talent servant, he says, you haven't done what I've asked you to do. And he's removed, they say, removed from the joy of the master and sent outside where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. So not a good situation. There's punishment. So the idea here, this is a parable, which is a story in scripture. It's not a historical account of actual events. It's a story used to elucidate a message. What's the message? You're each given different things, different talents, different gifts, different attitudes and preferences about risk. And they're not equal, they're different. But what is your job? Your job is to do the best you can to make the highest return you can. You are to seek profit, you are to invest wisely. So these ideas come at us again and again through scripture, and we see the narrative that scripture is trying to tell us, which is that in Genesis, the first chapter, the first book of the Bible, we understand what our marching orders are. And the ideas of, of how we do that come up again and again through the scripture. So now I want to talk a little bit about who we are. And this is where students of economics are going to hear things that you've heard before in your economics classes. Because good economics, the economic way of thinking, as I would say it, is based on certain understandings of the human condition. For Christians, we believe that those aspects of the human condition are anthropology or how we were created. You don't have to believe that to still understand and see these aspects of who we are. So this is, again, going to help us with the mechanisms of how it is that each of us are supposed to bring about flourishing. Flourishing is this very big idea that has kind of big global implications. So how are each one of us in our daily lives supposed to be a part of that? That can sound intimidating and overwhelming. But we have to recognize these aspects of our humanity that are universal. And what are those things? Well, one, we're unique. We are unique. There has never been a you, another you, on the planet, and there never will be another you. You are the only you. And even though some of you are going to be accounting majors and economics majors, and you're going to go maybe be an economics professor, you are only going to be an economics professor in the way you can do that. So you're bringing something special to the table, something important, something that you were created to do, and only you can do it the way you can. So we're unique, and that's important. It has really big implications for trade, which we'll talk about. The second idea of our anthropology is that we value things subjectively. We have our own desires and preferences. We seek different things. Right? Some very simple examples. Some people like, you know, olives on their pizza. Some people don't like olives on their pizza. So some people don't like pizza at all. So we value things subjectively. This is how we are created. So those preferences that are hardwired into who we are are going to be manifested in the things we choose and the things we desire. And so the bigger societal question are how do we align incentives so that people are on net encouraged or incentivized to choose things that help other people rather than plunder them? And that's a, that's a big question in human history, isn't it? So it's something we want to understand and, and kind of really want to understand how Christianity can help us get there. And we're intentional. 
So we do things for reasons. Our reasons are imperfect. We don't have the best information ever that we need to make decisions, right? We make uh, mistakes. Uh, we make uh, mistakes of omission and commission. So sometimes we actually maybe desire things we shouldn't and act on them. But we do things for a reason. You know, we're not automatons, we're not robots. Somebody winds us up in the back and sets us off. So we are intentional. And what is our intent? Our intent is to create value for ourselves. So we're all profit seekers. We're all trying to create value for ourselves by using our resources, our time, our energy, our creativity. And so the, again, the bigger question is how do we do this and we coordinate with other people on that rather than um, hurt each other in the process. And so this leads me to this idea that we're profit seekers. I think often when I'm speaking to audiences of people who claim to be Christians, they do not like to hear that profit seeking is part of who human beings are created to, is what we're hardwired to do. Profit is kind of a dirty word in 2016, depending on who you talk to, isn't it? So the idea is not, uh, I don't think earth shattering, I'm an economist though, is this idea that, and I have a clock here very intentionally, because I think, you know, first and foremost, we all seek to profit our time, right? Your students, you're gonna have exams coming up soon, what do you wanna do? You wanna get the best grade for the least amount of work. That doesn't make you a greedy jerk, it makes you a human who wants to profit their time, because then you have more time left over to do other things things that can make productive contributions to the world. So we're all profit seekers. Again, the big historical question is that it's a new phenomenon in human history that we can harness this profit seeking into the service of strangers. And that's what I really like to talk about, is how do we get a world where we serve strangers, where we actually make that our goal, to wake up in the morning and serve strangers. So our anthropology then brings us to kind of how we make decisions. Economists talk about this all the time. Adam Smith had a very good insight about human nature, which is that we are self-interested, right? I made the case that we're profit seekers and we're value creators. So the question is, how can I not just create value for myself, but how can, in trying to create value for myself, I create value for you as well? So self-interest can either fuel flourishing or destroy it. But here's the thing, self-interest is part of how we, it's our MO, it's how we make choices. We seek to create values for ourselves and we seek to always do it at the lowest possible cost. So this requires a certain and very specific institutional setting for this to work, but it's who we're created to be. So self-interest also is not contrary to any claims about Christianity. Self-interest is just how you choose. It is based on how you, uh, you know, kind of try to figure out or you know what your subjective preferences are and you try to actualize them. That's all it is. Greed is a whole different story, okay? Greed is kind of this unmitigated desire where we're willing to hurt, harm, plunder to get whatever we want. So there's a distinction there that I think needs to be made. Even scripture kind of alludes to this very kind of core idea of our humanity. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. So it's not that it's wrong to look to your own interests. It's that as a Christian, you're not supposed to only do that. Well, what set of institutions and incentives actually fosters that? How do we flip the switch? So you take the greediest person that you would never want to be around, that would lie, plunder, cheat, steal, all those bad things to get what they wanted. What kind of world can take people as they are and funnel those self-interested and perhaps greedy desires into productive ones? So what I kind of like to talk about in my work is that I want to reclaim the word stewardship in the kind of Christian space. When we think about stewardship, if you were, you know, went to a church um, when you grew up, you know, stewardship meant are you giving money to the church? Are you tithing? So Christians tend to focus on stewardship is how am I giving my money? 
or how am I giving my time to the church or to philanthropy, you know, more broadly understood. But what kind of these ideas that I've been building on help us understand is that stewardship is about profiting in everything that we do. And what we learn from Scripture and what's reinforced in the New Testament, it's reinforced, the Old Testament uh, message is reinforced in the New Testament, is that we're supposed to, we, we read in Genesis, we're supposed to fill the earth with, the, with his images, right? So we, th we could say that's having families, taking care of our families, things like that. But we're also supposed to subdue the earth, which means to create and build and work and invent and be entrepreneurs. So stewardship is about using every minute that you have, every decision that you make is a productive one, makes contributions to the greater good through increasing the amount of flourishing that we both get to experience and get to produce. So stewardship is, I kind of call this idea whole life stewardship. Stewardship is not just about what you do with your money, it's about what you do with every minute. And these are all require the economic way of thinking for us to do it well. So, at the Institute where I work, we've kind of, not coined this phrase, but we talk about this a lot, is this, uh, we call it the four-chapter gospel. This idea that is actually not new in Christian theology, but in the past 150 years, we've kind of truncated our uh, understanding of the meta-narrative of Scripture from a four-chapter gospel to a two-chapter gospel. So if you talk to most Christians, this is what they'll say is important. You're, you, you know, you're a sinner. You, because of the fall, we all sin. We need salvation. And so you get saved, and then the process of redemption happens in your life. And that's it. And if that's all there is, then um, a guy I work with calls it the mentality of having the bus ticket to heaven. So if you think that all you need to do is get saved, then nothing you do here matters because you've got your bus ticket. Now you just need to wait for the bus to come. You're on your way. But actually, understanding the meta-narrative of Scripture in all four chapters help us understand that creation is where we come from, and restoration, the final chapter, is where we're going. And you can read more about this in Christian theological circles, but the idea here is that when God comes back, when Christ comes back to restore his creation to the way it was supposed to be, all the work that you're doing here now gets restored. So that means that your work has eternal significance. Everything you do matters. You're not just holding the ticket, waiting for the bus to come. That your life still has meaning and purpose in the here and now. And the major you pick, the job you take, all of those things are significant and allow you to make contributions to flourishing. So this is kind of a paradigm shift in Christian circles, in Christian theology, that we need to understand the meta-narrative of Scripture to understand how we are supposed to adopt it in our lives and how it can be a useful mechanism for helping us understand what we're supposed to do. So, I want to bring in the economics. How does economics help us with all of this? Well, I think that, I know we have uh, some, a lot of economics professors here and PhD students, so you guys like economics like me, and you like to talk about economics, and we talk about it with each other, but most people don't like economics, right? They think that it's kind of conversations about GDP and trade deficits, it is that, but it's something so much more fundamental than that. So, you know, this is what Merriam-Webster has to say about economics, what economics is. And I just put this up here because I think, you know, okay, it's true. Is a social science concerned chief with description and analysis of the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services? And this is why people think economists are boring, because they don't think that applies to their lives, right? And so I like to do a little kind of, you know, just ask a little question for my, and my students and when I give lectures, which is that how many people in the last three months, you know, we're starting off a new semester, how many people have had a night where you couldn't sleep? And you tossed and turned, and you know, you had to go downstairs, and you read a boring textbook, or you got some, a warm glass of milk, you did whatever you could, right, to get to sleep that night. For how many of you that have had that situation, was the reason that you couldn't fall asleep because GDP didn't grow in the last quarter like you really wanted it to and you're really concerned about the implications for your personal life? No. Uh, okay, I got one. I always get one, so thank you for that. That's good. 
And you're one of like six people I know that, that worry about this. And that somebody needs to worry about it, I suppose. But economics is really so much more than that. It's about being good stewards. In fact, if you look at the Greek uh, word for stewardship in the New Testament, it's oikonomia, which is the root word for economics. And it means to manage a household. So the first things we do in our private lives are we manage our households, right? You manage your time, you manage your money, you manage your studies, you manage your job. Economics is not just about those lofty macro concepts that economists talk about. It is about those things, but there's no macroeconomics without microeconomics, and microeconomics is you and me, and the decisions we make, and the choices that we make, and the goals that we're after, and the institutional environment in which those things happen. So this is my effort to bring economics uh, personal, to make it personal, to make it part of stewardship. So if you're tracking with me on this Christian theology here, then I'm going to make the claim that you absolutely have to incorporate the economic way of thinking in your quest to be a good steward. In your quest to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, at the end of your life, you got to have the economic way of thinking. And not only that, it's not just enough. That doesn't, you also don't have to get a PhD in economics, so breathe a sigh of relief, to incorporate the economic way of thinking in your life. But we also have to advocate for a set of institutions in a society in which everybody can do this. And it's the places that suffer the most on the planet where people can't wake up and do this regardless of their reasons, whether their reasons are you know, based on the Bible or not. So to incorporate the economic way of thinking into our lives, I'd like to talk about a few economic realities. Okay, So these economic realities impose themselves upon us every day. It doesn't matter if we like them or not. So I have no idea how tall this building is. I didn't really look at it too well before I came in. But if I walked to the top of the building and walked across the roof and walked over to the edge, walked off the side, what would happen? Bad things, right? I would fall. And that's because gravity is my reality. It's my constraint, and I have to deal with it, and I have to live with it, and I have to try to overcome it, which might mean not walking off the side of tall buildings or preparing myself if I choose to do that. So economic realities impose themselves upon our lives every single day. And if we're going to make good stewards, uh, good stewardship decisions, meaning we're going to maximize the value that we can contribute to the world at the minimal cost that we have lots of leftovers, i.e. lots of profit, then we have to understand and accept these realities. So we live in a, in a world of scarce resources that have multiple and competing ends. Lesson one, right? Econ 101. <coughs> This is very pertinent as it pertains to your time and the choices that you make. Again, I would say that the major you choose is a stewardship decision. What, how you spend your studying time is a stewardship decision. How you spend your time and your hobbies and all these things, these are all about using time and once it's spent, it's gone. So you wanna make the most productive choices based on your values and what you think you're called to do. So our decisions bring costs. I think that in general people are pretty good about adopting this idea in their personal lives. Um, we're not necessarily always so good at adopting this in the policy space, but that's kind of a different conversation. The incentives are different. <coughs> Yet, even in our personal lives, we have to pay the cost, we have to pay the price of being wrong about these choices that we make. We need to learn, right? So. Understanding that scarcity is our constraint that kind of smacks us in the face every single day is the most, I would say, the core, the backbone of the economic way of thinking. And important for us to be prudent stewards. We can't create something out of nothing. I made this, this is what distinguishes us. God created us, it says, in his image and in his likeness. What does that mean? Well, it means we bear similar characteristics. We are also creators. God was a creator. We are creators. But we can't create something out of nothing. Ex nihilo. We can only create something out of something. So we can take the wood that's in the forest and make it into a table. 
We can take the brain that's in our head and figure out new ways to do accounting. Those are good things, but we can't create something out of nothing, which means, you know, this is Econ 101 also, right? There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. So if we could create something out of nothing, it's plausible that we could have free lunches all the time, right? So, you know, I think of, in my head, Adam and Eve in the garden. If you have eternity as your time horizon, it probably doesn't matter if you know, figure how to make a table today or you know, a cherry pie tomorrow, because you've got a really long time horizon. That's not our reality. And so we have to make these trade-offs knowing that when we do, we're giving something up and that imposes a cost upon us. And we're just limited. We have limited gifts and abilities. We are fine. We can't do everything we need to do to flourish. Nor can we do everything we need to do to help others flourish. So recognizing that these are the basis that we have a need to come together with other people and find a way to negotiate for what they, their talents. So I want you to think of trade as trading talents. You're trading your gifts, you're trading your abilities. And in doing so, you're lowering the cost of your own life, life and you're lowering the cost of the lives of others. And that's really important if we want to flourish. Last economic reality, we respond to incentives. So we have to have reasons and motivations to do something, to do these things. I think when I speak to Christian audiences, this is tough. Because we want to believe that people can throw off their self-interest and embrace kind of the, you know, kind of altruistic love of God and say, I'm going to do, you know, everything good for people. Um, I'm not going to care about what I want. I'm going to do, this is how I'm going to live my entire life. But that's not what we can do, right? We can't change the human condition. We can't change our anthropology. What we can do is figure out ways to incentivize, again, taking men as they are, men and women as they are, and incentivizing them to serve strangers. So this is a picture of Walmart, right? Walmart is a great place to go. They're, they've changed their mission statement many, many times. But it used to be always the lowest price. Always. So they use the word always twice to make a point. And I think now it's save money and live better. Their goal is for you to pay the least amount of money for your bananas as possible. But it's not because they love you. It's because when they do that well, they can make money. But to, for them to rake in the cash, you have to benefit somehow. So we're not relying on the Walmarts and the Amazons and uh, the apples of the world to just be altruistic. We're actually saying, what, you know, how can we get people to be encouraged through incentives to open Walmarts and say, you know what I care about? People paying the least amount possible for their bananas. That's important to me. When we can do these things well, when we embrace both our anthropology as humans, who we are, what, it, you know, kind of what does our humanity dictate our constraints and our obstacles and the limits of our abilities, and when we combine that with some basic economic realities of the world we live in, again, we don't have to like these, they just are, then we can escape survival mode and move into flourishing. And I'm making the claim to you that that's actually your job if you claim to be a Christian. Your job, bring about more flourishing. And your job is to do that however you've been gifted to do it. And so we tend to kind of highlight the entrepreneurs like the Bill Gates and the Steve Jobs of the world and say, wow, they made the world a better place. And they certainly did make the world a better place. But not everybody's created to be a Steve Jobs or a Bill Gates. So what about the janitor? What about the um, college student who works at Starbucks over the summer? You're serving other people when you're engaging those tasks that might not be your highest goal, they might not be, in some sense, the most fulfilling jobs you ever take, but if you're called to do it, you're asked to do it well. We understand that from the parable of the talents. Do it well. Do it with integrity. And when you do those things, even the jobs that you don't maybe love, that you'll never stay in forever, you actually are serving other people. And so, you know, for Christians, we talk about this word dignity a lot. Dignity is not based on the money that's in your Bank of America account at the end of the month. For Christians, dignity is based on your creation. 
You are an image bearer, and that is profound. And you are here to do something, and you have a big responsibility, again, regardless of the paycheck. So there's a lot of people who are stay-at-home moms. They get no income. Um, we could all agree that when you do that well, we're all better off, right? So this is not just income-based work. Trade is what brings us together. This is kind of the core of what I would call the economic way of thinking. Brings us together to be able to be outward focused. See, the problem when we can't trade, when we don't have a lot of trading partners, is that we're fo forced inward to do everything on our own. I've been thinking about this a lot. As Ben mentioned, I've been doing some work on income inequality and just thinking about how to as a Christian, how do we navigate that conversation and that debate? And what I think is really important for us all to do, if you're advocating for a certain idea or set of ideas, is to have a, um, a human face that you think about. Who is the person you want to help? Who is the person you care about? And so for me, I often think about my female counterpart, perhaps in a place like Zimbabwe or Ghana, and her biggest problem is not that she doesn't have human creativity and a desire to unleash it on the planet. That's not her problem. Her problem is that she lacks access to trading partners. And so I think about what her life is like every day versus what my life is like. And I think about water collection, which in the developing world falls on women and their daughters. And there's extremely high transactions costs and trade-offs that are associated with that. So when you think about water collection, what this woman has to do requires an enormous amount of calories. Yet she is stuck in abject poverty and doesn't have an enormous amount of calories. So she takes her daughters in tow to a water source that could be potentially four miles away, and she fills up dirty jugs, which you and I would never drink out of unless probably our lives depended on it, and she lugs it back, again, another four miles, and she crudely purifies it. We haven't even talked about washing the clothes. It's an entirely separate endeavor, but requires the transport of this dirty water. This is necessary for her survival. And it's like Groundhog Day. Every day, you gotta do it again, 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 again. The task doesn't go away. So it requires much of her time, her waking hours. It's very frustrating and hard, and it requires a lot of calories which she cannot consume. This is how you and I collect water. Oops. We go to Walmart, or we go to my grocery store is called Harris Tater. I don't know if you guys have that here, but you go to a grocery store, right? You go to the Circle K after class, and you think, I need some bottled water for my dorm room. This probably costs you, if you're just going to the grocery store to get the water, you could probably be in and out in 15, 20 minutes. Maybe you could be home and back in 15, 20 minutes. And it might cost you 100 calories. So what makes those of us who can do this to get water so special? We have a lot of trading partners. So we are not so focused inward on having to do everything that we need for our survival. Thriving is extremely difficult when you have to rely solely on yourself because we weren't made that way. We weren't built that way. That's not what we're wired for. Nor was it what God intended for us, to rely solely on ourselves. Anybody heard or um, have a guess as to who this is? It's a little obscure. Nobody recognizes him, right? Off the cuff. This is a guy named Henry Turkle. And I'm going to come back to him later, but he's really important. Uh, he's no longer with us. He was a doctor. And Henry Turkle saw a problem, innovated on the problem, and save lives because of it. So I'm gonna just tease you with that and come back to more later. Henry Turkle is an example of how we weren't meant to do things on our own. I like to do this thought experiment as well, which is I want you to think about all the things you did today before you left your house or your apartment or your dorm room. And there's a lot of things. Here's a very simplified list. I use my smartphone as my uh, alarm clock. And I try to bathe so I'm not so smelly, right? I like to be nice and clean for all my peers. And I brush my teeth. And I, that is not a picture of my closet. I wish it looked like that, but it does not. But I pick out clothes in the morning that I did not make. And I have breakfast. My breakfast also looks nothing like this. I'm shooting high here. I usually have a granola bar or something. And then I get in the car. 
I didn't do any of those things at all. I relied on hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people every day for things that I actually take for granted, but that allow me to have a very different life than my female counterpart in the developing world. I had nothing to do with those things. I don't know how to make them. I don't know how to make them happen. Toothbrushes, beyond me. Don't know how to make them. It's freeing that I don't have to know how to make them. It frees up a lot of my time to actually focus on my gifts and cultivate those. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Cast Away, but it's a great example of what life is like when you're forced inward on your own. So Tom Hanks is a Federal Express executive. Uh, it's Christmas Eve, he's proposed to his girlfriend. Life is great. Gets on a cargo plane to go back home, crashes on a desert island as the only survivor. And the rest of the entire movie is him trying to figure out just how to do a few things that are necessary. He's got to eat, he's got to drink water every day, he needs a little bit of shelter from the sun, but his biggest concern is getting off the island. The problem is, if he can't do those kind of, you know, eating and drinking and having some shelter every day, he's never going to get off the island. And so it's a really good example of what it's like when we're forced inward to do everything on our own. We cannot thrive under those conditions. Why? Because we are interdependent and we're made that way. We need each other. Now, there's something that radical that's happened across the course of recent human history that has allowed us to go from the castaway experience, for those of us particularly in this room, into a life of great affluence. And I know as college students, you don't think of yourself as affluent, and in real terms, you are. We are in an air-conditioned room with overhead lights, looking at a projector, lots of computers in this room, right, in your pockets. Most economists who have done kind of the calculations on this look at um, global GDP, average global GDP from AD zero to now. And for most of human history, we lived on close to zero. Less than $100 a year. Forced inward. Castaways. What caused that to shift? Well, I'm going to make the case that it's economic freedom and that we need that. And as a Christian, if you believe what the scripture tells you about your life and what your job is, then you have to advocate for economic freedom. Because it's the only way that you're going to be able to do what you're supposed to do, whatever that is. And only, that's, you know, I don't know what each of you are supposed to do. We only know ourselves. So economic freedom is this idea that when we can exchange, when we have well-protected property rights and the property rights of others are well-protected, then we can choose where we're going to go grocery shopping and what's going to go into our Amazon cart and what businesses we're going to open or not open. And so economists empirically measure this. I'm not going to go into a great level of detail here. But what we do is we try to measure five different things. And then we rank a country based on these things, the size of government relative to the size of the economy, the security of the property rights that people have or don't have, the soundness of their money, which affects what you can, how much you can afford to have, it affects your consumption, freedom to trade internationally, and the regulation of different markets, credit, labor, business. How hard is it for you to open a business? How easy for is it for insiders in a business to keep outsiders out? Those are the types of things we measure. And we score countries on a scale of zero to 10. Zero means no freedom, 10 means lots of freedom. Nobody's a zero, according to the rankings, and nobody's a 10. So we live kind of in the middle. And I don't want to talk to you so much about how we measure it. This is you know, what I'm going to do there. But because again, I think it's the GDP question, right? You're not going to go to sleep maybe tonight and worry about our position on the economic freedom of the world report and where it's going. Maybe you are. I, I'm certainly worried about that. But I'm an economist. But what you are worried about is where are you going to get a job? Where should you move? Who should you marry? Should you open a business or work for someone else? These are the decisions, the stewardship decisions of your life. And economic freedom allows you to more freely pursue them as you see fit, but not at the expense of other people's property and their ability to do it. So this requires sacrifice, restraint, and prudence. But what I really think is exciting is some of the outcomes of economic freedom. First off, it's on the rise. 
you look at 1985 to about 2013, you know, we're averaging a 5.36, kind of dead center there in 1985. 2013, 6.85, I would say we have a lot of work to do. There's many places where we go in to try to measure economic freedom and we can't even get reliable data because the places are so poor, so broken, so corrupt, and so oppressed. As believers, as Christians, we would say our job is to help the poor, the marginalized, the vulnerable of the world. How do we do that? Well, we help advocate for systems that allow them to live into whoever it is they're supposed to be. And even if you're not a Christian, there's very self-interested reasons to care about increasing economic freedom across the world. Because people who are living in abject poverty, as I've described it, means that they cannot fully unleash their human creativity on the planet. So we're missing out on entrepreneurs. We're missing out on innovations. We're missing out on medical breakthroughs. We're missing out. We don't want them to miss out, and we don't want to miss out. So this is a system that aligns incentives for cooperation and problem solving. And it has just a few outcomes that I think as Christians come to the table, the things that Christians care about, both your own stewardship and how to help others, are really important for us. And one is just income goes up a lot. So if you look at the red or the least free, the blue or the most free, per GDP per capita is about $7,000 in the countries that are the least free. It's about $39,000 in the countries that are most free. That's a dramatic difference. Remember the woman who walks to get to the water. She needs 3,000 calories. She gets 500, 1,000. How do we help her get more calories? And then after she gets more calories, how do we help her get more productive? So that it doesn't take eight hours of her day. Income is the first step in that direction. Economic freedom is related to decreases in extreme poverty. So again, look, if you're in the least free countries, Extreme poverty, 30.6%. It's very high compared to most free economies, 1.9. So the advantages for the people who are the most vulnerable, the most marginalized in a society are profoundly impacted for the good when they have more economic freedom rather than less. Life expectancy. This is about being a profit seeker. The more time you have on the planet, the more of your human creativity you can unleash on it. It's about a 20-year difference between the least free economies and the most free economies. Imagine another generation of grandparents and children. That's a lot. That's important. Infant mortality goes drastically down when you live in a society with a lot of economic freedom versus a little economic freedom. So these are the outcomes that we care about. I suspect these are the outcomes that you all care about. That when you think about the world and the things that you're worried about, it's this stuff. This is just a big map of economic freedom around the world, and it shows you can see the red or the mostly unfree economies, um, and you know, kind of going on a scale to blue. We have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of people who, through no fault in their, of their own, wake up and don't have a lot of hope for increasing their income. How can we affect that? How can we change that? I would say it comes down to a very simple economic idea and idea that we can glean from scripture, which is they need to be able to use their talents, and that means they need trading partners. So I like to talk about, I showed you a picture of toothbrushes. I'm gonna wrap it up now. And I like to talk about George Washington. I like to talk about toothbrushes a lot. So this is George Washington, and I want you to think of what, what do you have that he didn't? You know, George Washington was a powerful guy, a politically connected guy. Um, he will go down in the ages uh, for his role as <clears throat> in American politics. But you have a lot of things that he didn't have. Uh, he didn't have Listerine, and he didn't have floss. And I know that sounds silly, but George Washington was actually really concerned about these ideas. Uh, he talked a lot about teeth. You can go to Mount Vernon, uh, George Washington's, uh, it's a privately run museum, and there's a lot of information on how George Washington is very concerned about his teeth. And the reason he was concerned about his teeth is because when he was inaugurated into office, he had one left. And so he had all these dentures made, and dentures made in 1781 were not the same quality of the dentures we have today. And so he was very self-conscious about wearing them because they would fall out and he was an orator, so this is a problem if you're on stage and your teeth fall out, right? But more importantly, it's actually 
highly correlated with longevity, dental innovations. Because in, let's say 1500, if you're 25 and you have a rotten tooth and it, that infection spreads to your brain, you're dead, right? That's gonna cut your flourishing. It's gonna truncate your well-being if you die at 25. George Washington actually says in one of his letters, in all my teaching, I have watched carefully the influence of the toothbrush. And I am convinced there are few single agencies of civilization that are more far reaching. He loved the toothbrush. I encourage you to go on the website to see the toothbrush he used versus the one you use. And there's, again, no blistering, no floss, no, you know, anything. So the reason I bring up the toothbrush here is because it's brought to you by economic freedom. And you get to take it for granted. Most people, hopefully I'm changing this, but when you wake up in the morning and you brush your teeth, you're not like, this is amazing. I'm excited to be alive and I'm brushing my teeth. It's just kind of a thing you do and you move on with your day, right? Economic freedom brings you toothbrushes, which elongate your lives. They make sure that you are not going to be like George Washington. You're going to die probably with most of your teeth in your mouth. And we're living to 100 at an increasing rate, so that's actually really important. You need a lot more mileage out of your teeth. Economic freedom saves our lives in benign ways that we take for granted, and it's a, a privilege that we get to take it for granted. I think of this poor boy at the dentist. He looks a little terrified. That's how I feel when I go into the dentist's office. I should probably hug my dentist and call him a hero, but I kind of have this reaction. I get to take it for granted. I get to take economic freedom for granted. I don't think we should. I think that's part of the problem. But then there's going to be moments where economic freedom smacks you in the face because it saves your life. And this is my story about how that happened in my life. This is my daughter. Her name is Bailey Grace. And she's, uh, she was, well, I went into labor at 26 weeks, which is extremely dangerous. And I was rushed to the hospital where my doctor met me and said, uh, yeah, you're in, you're, your water has broken, so you can't go back home. And we actually can't keep you at this hospital because if you deliver here, we can't handle micropremies, which is what your baby will be. And so we're going to rush you by ambulance, outfitted with a NICU in it, to a teaching hospital down the road. So I went to that hospital where I stayed on the hospital bed rest for five weeks. And every four hours of those five weeks, medical students, nurses, doctors came in and checked on me every four hours, and they did a couple of things. They took my temperature. They checked my blood pressure, and they put monitors on my belly to uh, identify the baby's heartbeat. And I have to tell you that every time they put those monitors on, you have a few second lag before the heartbeat shows up, it took my breath away. And any of those things that would have not been normal, my uh, blood pressure, my temperature, would have been an immediate C-section. And so every day that didn't happen was felt like a miracle. And I had a window in my hospital room where I sat for five weeks and thought a lot of big thoughts, I think. And I remember thinking about my female counterpart. My mind was focused on Bangladesh at the time, and I thought, well, gosh, what's her story? Because you know there are women who go into premature labor in Bangladesh, and they don't have the same ending that I got. And it's not because I did anything. I know nothing about all the medical technology that made it possible for my baby not to actually be born until 31 weeks. My Bangladesh female counterpart does not get the same outcome. Why? She doesn't have economic freedom. It's not her fault. And we all suffer because of it. So when Bailey Grace, my daughter, was born, this is how she lived for five weeks in a NICU. Preemies can't do three really important things. They can't feed themselves, they can't, they're not strong enough to drink on their own, they can't regulate their heart rate, and they can't regulate their body temperature. And if they fail at any one of those things, they will die. And so she lived in a NICU, this is her, how she lived for five weeks, and you see these cords going into her feet with a kind of like pink glow on the side, that's a uh, monitor that's measuring her heart rate. And uh, every time her heart rate crashed, alarm bells went off and people came running. It was terrifying the whole time. But I want to draw your attention to, if you can see her face. 
On her face, there's a very tiny tube. It's white. It's taped to her cheek. She's three pounds, five ounces at the time this was taken. And this feeding tube, is there's a loop on it, and it's going through her nose and into her belly. That feeding tube did something for her that was really important that she couldn't do for herself, which was feed her. And remember, if I asked you if you knew who Henry Turkle was? He invented the infant nasal feeding tube. He filed a patent for it in 1953. He was doing work with Down syndrome's babies and realized they had trouble with the sucking mechanism. And so he filed a patent for this and perfected the technology of being able to deliver food to very, very tiny babies who have muscular challenges. So Henry Turkle, who I'll never get to say thank you to, saved my daughter's life. He was an important part of that, but not just him. Because I want you to think of the chain of people that were involved in getting that feeding tube to the hospital where I was. There was a Federal Express truck driver who delivered the boxes of feeding tubes. There was a janitor who took all the boxes and threw them in the recycling bin after they were unpacked. Every single one of those people, countless people that I don't know, that I cannot say thank you to because they're strangers to me, were part of the process. And they each had a significant role to play. All the way down to the job that you think is the least glamorous, whatever that may be. That's economic freedom. It saves lives. And we need more of it. This is the after picture. So here's, here's the reason I show this. This is my little picture of flourishing at my point in my life right now. Brought to me by economic freedom. It's a very humbling idea. I had nothing to do with it. If it was left to me to save Bailey's life, her life wouldn't have been saved because I couldn't do it on my own. None of us can. We need each other. So we as Christians need to advocate for a society where we are encouraged. Again, these incentives apply across believers and non-believers in Christianity alike. That when we use our gifts, when we apply our talents as we were created to, we get more flourishing. And when we get more flourishing, everybody's better off. So I'm going to stop there and take questions if anybody has them.